Hi, and welcome to this Bailey Gifford live webinar on the Scottish American Investment Company. I'm Katrin Schindler from CityWire, and with me is James Dow, who's the co-manager of Saints. The way this works is I'll be picking James's brain with my questions for about 30 minutes, and then it's time for your questions. So if you have any, please submit them at any time via the chat, and then I'll put them to James in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the session. And on that note, let's dive right in. James, welcome, and great to have you. Hello, hi, thanks for having me. Thanks to everyone who's dialed in. I appreciate it. So good to see you. Wonderful. James, um, let's start with a broad look on SANES. So the, the fund serves two types of investors. We have income seekers on the one hand and we have the growth investors on the other. How are you able to make both of them happy? Oh, good question. So um, there, there's a special type of company that, that one can invest in. Um, and it, it delivers, certainly historically, we think the future, fantastic returns both to income investors and growth investors. So it can keep um, both, both types of investor happy. And, and that, that's the type of company that uh, we, we aim to own a portfolio of in Saints. So when I say a special type of company, what do I mean? I mean, um, these are companies which have really good long-term growth prospects of so compounding their, their, their profits higher year after year. Um, they've got really sustainable business models. So that means you can count on them to, to own them, not just for one or two years, but for, for a decade or more. And they're able to pay out resilient dividends as well. So they, they typically generate a lot of, sort of surplus cash, which they, they are committed to paying out as dividends. That, that special type of company, if you invest in a portfolio of those, historically, and, and, and our belief is, you get fantastic results, whether you're an income-seeking investor or you're a growth-seeking investor. They, they just give you uh, terrific results. So, um, for example, um, Atlas Copco, the Swedish engineering company, that's an example we've owned for more than a decade within Saints. Um, or Microsoft would be another example, another one we've owned for uh, 12, 13 years now. Um, that's the kind of company I'm talking about. Um, great growth, sustainable business model, resilient dividends, makes income investors super happy with dividends and returns and the resilience of that income stream, but also makes growth investors really happy as well with capital appreciation and great total returns. So, mm -hmm. so that's how we do it. Now, you've already touched on that now, but you're more tilted towards growth than value. How do you think that will work out for you this year? Oh, well, um, of course, it's always difficult to say exactly what the, the year will hold. Um, but I guess I'd observe that we are not really positioned for very high growth, nor are we value. We're, we're what I describe as sort of core growth. We're a, a sort of more balanced approach, definitely tilted towards growth, as you say, um, but not, not particularly extreme. We're, we're quite big on balance within Saints and, and not going to extremes. Um, and so... Um, how will that play out this year? It depends a little bit on how markets do, but I, I think we own a portfolio where the companies can do well pretty much whatever is thrown at them. They, they can mm -hmm. thrive. So, for example, last year, it was really interesting that, you know, uh, I think folks I will be aware, we had this huge shift from growth towards value mm -hmm. last year. And you'd say, oh, well, that's bad news for growth oriented trust like saints right but actually the trust outperformed last year despite that huge shift towards value and i think that's because the underlying companies we, we try to own you know really good high quality companies that can thrive almost sort of like whatever the weather that, that kind of thing mm -hmm. wonderful now within your portfolio you focus more on um companies like novo nordisk and apple instead of the usual well uk income stalwarts like bp and shell mm. Um, none of them is particularly known for paying particularly high dividends. So how do you explain that approach to more traditional income investors? Yeah, okay, so I would, you're, you're right that they're not really known in terms of having a high yield, like a, a starting yield, compared with like a big oil company or a bank, which might be on, I don't know, four, four or five percent yield. Um, but the way I explain that is, as, as investors, and certainly we as managers, I think most people are actually looking over a much longer time horizon. Mm -hmm. you know, they'll typically have a five, 10 year, let's say you're in retirement or you're in endowment or a charity, whatever, whatever. You, you've probably got a time horizon that lasts 10, 20 more years. And if you look over those periods of time, those kind of classic income stalwarts, the, the, the high yielders, 
typically they they have tended to work out a lot worse for income and growth investors than the, the kind of special companies I talked about at the start, where there's not such a high yield, but they're really good, solid businesses and they've got really good growth prospects with sustainable business models. So if you look back at, um, you know, I'm do doing this backwards. Obviously, we're investing in the future. I'm doing this backwards looking because it, it's sort of it's a, it's a proof point. If you look back at something like a, a, a Microsoft or, or an Apple, or you can, you can pick your name, and you look at how much income you've received over the past 10 or 15 years from those names, mm -hmm. even though they've typically had a much lower starting yield than a BP or a Shell, they can end up delivering, have ended up delivering more income over that whole period of time. Because mm -hmm. one of them is starting high, but it's typically flat, and then it's getting cut and it's going lower. Whereas this one is sort of compounding higher and higher, it catches up and eventually surpasses that original yield. And so the way I explain the focus of the fund, which, as you say, is very much on solid dividend growth from a lower yield is, well, because you've got a longer term horizon, you're going to be much better off owning that kind of company over the long run, in income and capital terms, than you are buying one of those rather troubled high yield companies, which, which look attractive for the first year. And then after that, it's, it's often all downhill. Mm -hmm. What role would you say does ESG play in the whole in your whole investment process? Because we can't we can't have a webinar like that without talking about ESG, basically. <laughs> well, I I, I think um, and the board of saints is hundred percent agree agreed with this. Um, I think it's really really vital for for mm -hmm. stock picking, and that's because if you think about it. it Again, if you've got those long term outcomes and you're looking for compounding in earnings and dividends year after year for long periods of time. If you've got a, if you're not paying attention to it, if you if you're just saying, oh, it's all greenwashing and nonsense and I don't care about it, I just want to make money. You know, people say that. I think the, the, the problem is, is that um, the odds of you making money actually go down a lot, because if you're investing in companies which are harmful, really harmful in some way, that sooner or later, history would tell you, people switch away from the products or they get found out or, or, or something goes wrong. So the odds of getting that kind of um, success, that compounding, that resilient dividend, that growth over a 10 or 15 year period is much better if you do proper ESG analysis And you make sure, hey, mm, this doesn't look so good. You know, I'll stay away from this. I, I don't see how this business can really thrive over the next 10 years. And you've, you see that time and again. I mean, um, I've seen it in my career with um, coal, coal mining companies, you know, were a classic income play. But over the long term, really disappointing. Tobacco companies over long periods of time have really struggled to deliver good earnings and dividend growth. Yeah. Um, it's why we don't have any oil and gas companies in the portfolio today, because we really struggle to believe that. So... Short version, I'd say it's critical as is part of our analysis, and it's, it's a big part of what we do on Saints. Mm -hmm. Are there any other macro trends apart from ESG, if you want to call ESG a macro trend, that influence your stock picking process? It really is bottom up, to be honest. It's not really big macro calls. I think, mm -hmm. you know, if you look back at the history of an investment, people who've made really good returns for clients over prolonged periods of time. It's 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 really tough doing that with macro calls. Um, I, I know enough economics to know that most economic forecasts are not particularly valuable, let's say. So, um, you know, we think about the last few years, I, I was amusing myself, I was writing the manager's report for Saints at the end of last year and looking back at the at macro predictions that were common in the last few years, right? And not, none of them predicted what would happen. They're completely <laughs> off. You know, no one predicted COVID. No one predicted, et cetera. So we, we really try to focus on companies that, you know, bottom up independently can continue to do well what, whatever the world is throwing at them. Mm -hmm. So if we've got a bit of a recession this year, if we've got whatever is happening in the macro, I'm really optimistic about the companies that we own, that they can continue to deliver steady, not, not shoot the lights out, but steady compounding, good, resilient earnings and dividends growth. If you look at a Novo Nordisk, in, which is our single biggest holding in the equity portfolio, as an example, mm -hmm. I think the trends towards diabetes treatment, its new products, its new um, formulations there will continue to drive good revenue, profit, dividend growth this year, 
pretty much re regardless of the macro. So it's very much a focus on the the, the, the companies and, and not on the on the macro trends, to be honest. So do external events, for example, like cross-border conflicts or mm -hmm. like yeah. governments that are changing, do they have any impact on your investments or do you just soldier on as usual, basically, because you're in it for the long run anyway? Well, I guess it, it, it would depend a bit what it is that we were talking about. I mean, we're not, um, you know, if, if, if the long term outlook really changes for, for a holding because of some cross-border event, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll definitely adapt to that. You know, that's kind of the, the the beauty, if you like, of active management, or why I think shareholders, you know, are paying a fee is be, because they're they're trusting their active manager to ad adapt and and move on when when things really change. So mm -hmm. if those things do come up and and they do occasionally, then we would adapt and and we would you know, recalibrate our growth assessment. But having said that, you know. I would say look you look back at the history of really successful companies over long periods of time. Um, okay, let's take uh, Procter and Gamble uh, is a holding for us. Procter and Gamble has been going over a hundred years like Saints. It's gone through an enormous number of cross-border conflicts, political changes, changes of government, et cetera, et cetera. If you've got a really good, strong, diversified business, it should be able to keep going despite that. So, so my base case would be to expect we own good companies that we wouldn't have to change much if we had that kind of event you're talking about. But of course, ultimately, we'd we'd adapt if 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 something really, really changed um, profoundly for one of those holdings. Cool, understood. And um, I mean, Bailey Gifford itself doesn't really strike me as a company of yes men so how heated do um, investment debates actually get when you have those discussions yeah not yes men or yes women i can assure you there's independent <laughs> minds regardless um how heated do our discussions get gosh that's a good question um so i here's, here's what i think is important is you know as long as you're all aligned around what you're trying to achieve for your, your shareholders and your clients so mm -hmm. for us, that's about that, all that stuff about long-term good growth, resilient dividends, sustainable business models, that kind of thing. Then all of your debate is really just focused on, hey, does, is this company a great fit for what we're trying to do or, or not? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? And so do, do we have heated debates? Yeah, from time to time, if we disagree about, oh, I, I think, you know, SAP actually has a terrible growth outlook and the dividend isn't at all resilient. And we have those debates, but they're not kind of, and, and, and no, there are no yes women or yes men in the room who was just sort of, oh, yes, okay, whatever you say. We don't have that. We all have our opinions, but it's done in a hopefully a productive and constructive way. So we're just debating those kind of facts and the evidence and, and, and where possible, just sort of trying to do it in quite a calm and rational manner. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get the benefit of, 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 of you know, independence and, and strong beliefs and all that and, and conviction, but but not in a sort of heated sort of, uh, you know, fisticuffs flying kind of way. <laughs> that doesn't happen. So uh, <laughs> no, it's that all sounds good. healthy. Great. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know you shouldn't pick favorites, but if you had to, if I had to put you on the spot, is there any company that you think would be particularly appealing right now in your portfolio? I mean, you mentioned wow. Novo Nordisk, which is the biggest holding, as you said, but is it also your favorite or are there any underdogs maybe yeah. that you find attractive? It'll be up. This is a bit like, you know, if you had to choose one of your children, but if you <laughs> which one, but it's a bit like, oh, God. Um, um, we, we like all, all 60 of our holdings genuinely. So that's why they're in very the diplomatic. Um, but um, yeah, the, the larger positions that would tell you those are the ones that we have higher conviction in. We think the odds odds are you know best skewed in our favour. Um, so yeah, so Novo Nordisk would be up there as one of them. Um, TSMC is, in my opinion, one of the world's great great businesses. Not not without you know geopolitical questions and so forth, but a, just a fantastic company with great growth prospects. Um, Microsoft is right, it's just, and it's just gone from strength to strength over the years. Um, Apple, I'm, so I'm picking out the larger holding here. here. These are companies which are a terrific fit for what we're trying to do for St. Shareholders. They've mm -hmm. got an incredible track record. They've got great people running them and they've got great prospects ahead of them. I mean, you, you, if you dig into them, you think you come away thinking like, oh, I, I, I've got to own a piece of that business. It's just fantastic. So, um, so yeah, those, those bigger holdings would be right up there. Mm -hmm. 
Now, you also, or one portion of your portfolio is also invested in uh, property and infrastructure. Mm. Are you planning to expand that exposure in light of current borrowing costs? Uh, no, we'll, we'll probably keep it about the same. It's a, it's sort of, um, in, in, in aggregate, it's maybe getting up to about 10% of total assets, ballpark sort mm -hmm. of figure. And, and uh, the, the background here is, is that, you know, as, a, as an investment trust, Saints has the advantage that it can borrow very long term and at quite mm -hmm. attractive rates. And in fact, last year, we refinanced all of the company's debt um, for the next 25 years at just under 3%. All right. Um, and, and and then the idea is, is that, um, you know, we can take that borrowing. It's, it's, it's prudent borrowing. This is not huge amounts of borrowing, just to keep mm -hmm. it in context. It, it, it totally is 95 million. Um, so again, about 10% of the trust. And yeah. when we take that kind of borrowing and then we invest that in the property, the infrastructure, but a fixed income, sort of matching them. And the idea is, is that the returns on those investments should, uh, you know, healthily exceed the 3% cost, cost of borrowing. And in fact, they, they have done that. So um, I, I, we've got those rates locked in and I'm anticipating it's ultimately a board decision about how much we do that. But um, given the size of the trust and what's prudent, I'm anticipating that exposure will remain about the same. Okay, good to know. And then you actually have a second manager who focuses specifically on the property portfolio. Mm, so yeah. how does how does he go about um, sourcing investments, seeking out potential opportunities? Yeah, so so that's that's Olim, and they've been running that property portfolio since the nineteen nineties. Um, they've done a fantastic job, fantastic job over time. Um, Matthew and Louise, um, more recently, the last sort of 10, 15 years. Um, and how do they do that? Well, what they do is they, well, first of all, they're very long-term oriented like us. So they're, they're looking for those great long-term property investments. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're, they're really focused on inflation protected leases. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they're very experienced investors and they, they understand inflation. They've been around a long time. And so that they've always had a focus on that. And that you can see that in the portfolio. Um, and they're, they're, they, they love kind of overlooked or slightly esoteric or, unusual things that don't fit into the sort of big property funds mm -hmm. that are a bit, a bit unusual a bit quirky but where you've got really you know great tenant long lease inflation protection and and they, they they've got a big focus on second use as well so that if the tenant changed or left or whatever then there's really good support to the asset value of that property as well mm -hmm. so all of those things are focus uh, focus points for them and and they, they've done a they've done a super job um over time but that's how they do it Wonderful. Um, switching from property to fixed income, are you thinking about delving into fixed income a bit more, maybe in the next six months? Uh, well, certainly the, the the yields on fixed income have gone up quite mm -hmm. dramatically the past um, year or so with interest rates rising. So um, we don't we don't have any great plans to shift the allocation dramatically towards that. But there are a few mm -hmm. things that are coming up, and and you know we're always doing that thing of saying well. Rather than, you know, we, we beat the cost of borrowing here, we're get, getting 6% versus 3%, but we can switch into this, which is just as good and earn 8%. So we're always doing that compare and contrast, but it's more that kind of individual level, I'd say, rather than, a, than any kind of asset allocation shift. Understood. And you've already mentioned Saints has been around for more than 100 years. I have it celebrating its 150th anniversary this year. That's right, I hope yeah. that number is through. Wonderful. Yeah. Do you think it'll make it another... Well, 150 years, or is that too optimistic? What's your stance? What's the outlook for the future? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about that. I, I think so. Yeah, because um, it, uh, let's ask, how has it got to 150 years? How has it got? How has it been going for so long and, and, and doing that? Um, I'd say a few different things. Um, it's, it's got a very engaged board. You know, I mm -hmm. think it's, it's not a sort of investment trust where people are just kind of coming along and connecting a salary. And sorry, I'm probably disparaging other investment trusts, but, you know, it's a very, it, it, very engaged in board who really care about it and the history. And they're very proud to, to I think, to work for, for Saints. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's that's been true for a long time. And that really matters because um, over time, you know, companies have to adapt. The, the world changes and moves on. And so you want a board who's got that oversight, who's saying, hey, uh, we need to change a little bit or we need to get on the front foot or we need to think more about this or or if the manager's underperforming for a, for a long period, you know, change the manager. And and that mm -hmm. sort of engaged and, and active board has always been a feature of Saints and it's very much the case still today. Mm -hmm. 
and yeah, ultimately the, the, the trust has been very resilient. Um, obviously, a revenue reserve helps, and 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 we've always adapted to, to times that they've gone on. So, well, I don't know what the next 150 years holds. I guess none of us has crystal balls out quite that far. Um, I, I'm I, I'm optimistic. Yeah, that that those strengths will be just as relevant and keep keep the trust going for a long time to come. Mm -hmm. Because you mentioned your engaged board, what's the turnover in the investment team actually, roughly? Ooh, but very, very low. I mean, as, I mean, I think, you know, Bailey Gifford as managers, I think you'll know we have a really quite low turnover of staff. We tend to be yeah. you know, people who have, oh, I, you know, once I left school, I joined Bailey Gifford and I've been here for a thousand <laughs> years. You know, it's just one of those places where people really love working here and they're here for a long time. Um, yeah. So, so it's it's very, uh, very low. I mean, case we do have, we do, fresh people do join, but um, it's on, on the team, there, there was one person who moved on last year. We have a couple of graduates who are always rotating, but it's a it's a stable team. Mm -hmm. That actually leads nicely to my last question before we move on to the audience questions, which is more of a personal one, because oh. you did a master's in economics and philosophy. Okay. And then before joining Bailey Gifford, you were a business reporter. That's right. So I'm wondering, how does all that fit into what you're currently doing can you did you learn anything from all those three different areas is there anything you can benefit from okay yeah 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 um good i wondered where the personal question was going and be like so how on earth did it go it's on? not too personal yeah, okay worry. um this is great so um how do those benefit so i would say the philosophy um studying philosophy is more useful as a fund manager over long periods than studying economics might be controversial and <laughs> apologies to anyone who studied economics and i'm sure you do a great job um but i would say that philosophy is very helpful because investing it can be quite an emotional it can be quite an emotional thing you know when yeah. you especially if you're dealing with your own savings you're dealing with other people's money the cycles and ups and downs and what do you do when the world is you know, we have COVID and oh my goodness, and investors are subject to huge behavioral biases. You, know, you can see that based on it over time. And they, they're humans, you know, they tend to, to they tend to be gung ho when things are wonderful. And then they tend to panic when things are awful. Yeah. What's that got to do with philosophy? Well, I think, you know, you, you, the kind of calm, rational, studied, methodical, logical approach and trying to take the emotion and the behavioral bias out of things is something that you mm -hmm. learn in studying philosophy, I believe. And so I think that's super helpful for, um, for being an investor. Being a journalist is also helpful because, well, a whole range of reasons. You're never afraid to ask stupid questions. If, you, mm -hmm. if you're a journalist, you get that knocked out of you pretty quick. I know I did. And so that's a great asset because then you're always ready to ask the questions that no one else dares ask. So I think that's a, that, that, that's a huge one. Um, but anyway, I'll stop there. There's, there I, I like to think there's a there's quite a few things that I was able to to bring from that background into this job. Mm -hmm. Stoic attitude combined with being able to ask painful questions. That sounds about right to me. Good. Wonderful. Then uh, moving on to the audience questions, which have been pouring in. I'll start with that one, which focuses on the fund's positioning. Yeah. And the question is, has the trust positioned itself for a recession or does it not foresee one? And, uh, let me say this with that. I'm, I hope this doesn't sound glib. I would say Saints is is kind of always positioned for a recession in the sense mm -hmm. that when if you focus on really high quality companies and and part of your process is to think really hard about resilience across cycles, then well, as it is for Saints, you know mm -hmm. that, that dividend record for for many many years and so forth. Um, you in a way your your portfolio is is always positioned for, for, for that recessionary environment, or you, you hope mm -hmm. it is. Now, it doesn't mean that share prices don't go down. Of course they do, but you, you, there's nothing that shouldn't, that should derail the fundamentals of the companies over the long term. So um, I'd say that's how we're positioned. Gotcha. And then there's also, I find this question actually pretty interesting. Um, it focuses on your 150th anniversary and how you position for the future. And this person is asking, are you looking for future income or growth opportunities in Africa, India, or other frontier markets that are not really that known for income? Yes, um, and have done for, for many years. It's, it's, it can be challenging because often those markets are by their nature quite volatile and the companies there 
have a lot of challenges to deal with. So, mm -hmm. so finding that kind of resilience in dividends and sustainability of models that we look for can be a bit of a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. But absolutely, we look there because on the other hand, some of those, th you know, if you look back in history, some of those uh, markets have thrown up fantastic companies and they can have fantastic growth prospects. So mm -hmm. um, if you look at something uh, like AVI in the portfolio today, the South African um, consumer business, um, it's been a very resilient dividend. Um, in truth be told, the growth hasn't really delivered in the way that we hoped it would over the past eight or nine years that we've been investing, um, mm -hmm. because it's been a very challenging place to do business and inflation and so on and so forth. But um, it's been it's been okay. It's just not re not really what we wanted. So that's an example of where we're prepared to invest, where where we can find the the growth, the the dividends, the sustainability that we're looking for. Yes. Okay, sounds promising. Um, this question focuses on your um, property exposure, and it's pretty simple. It's basically asking, why do you actually invest in property at all? Um, it's it's a great way. Well, we, as I said before, it's, it's funded out of the borrowings, so we're trying to sort of beat that three percent, and it, it generates extra extra income and extra return. It done mm -hmm. well as, as Olim mm -hmm. have for, for our shareholders, um, and it's and another benefit of all that is if you think of the income resilience of the whole portfolio then having a little bit in property in infrastructure in fixed mm -hmm. income helps dampen things down a little bit as well helps to bring a little bit more resilience to the entire portfolio so it's the combination of you know uh, uh returns that are attractive and beat the cost of borrowing it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a nice thing to do within the investment trust structure and it helps diversify things and and, and reduce a bit of volatility at the, the portfolio level too mm -hmm. makes sense um this question is about your fees, and um, the mm -hmm. person is basically asking, why are Saints fees so high compared to other trusts? I would hazard a guess that that's a figure from the infamous kids documents that have been done, introduced in the past few years. Mm -hmm. And the, the unfortunate thing with those documents is that they include, if a trust borrows, as, as we do, they include the borrowing costs in the fees. I, I hope this mm -hmm. is what the person's getting at. I'm guessing this is the num these are the numbers they're looking at. Um, so it makes, if, if you have a bit of debt, like Saints does, even if it's very low cost debt, it makes your fees look crazy compared with trusts that don't have any borrowing in them. If you, mm -hmm. if you look through to the actual underlying fees of Saints, mm -hmm. they are, well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say be better than the average trust, actually. They're, they're very competitive. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I suspect that, whoever's looking at these outrageous fees is looking at the numbers that come out of the kids documents which include borrowing probably. costs which you say is it unfair to include yeah probably um coming back to your engaged investment board there is one question that asks um are you looking to engage in a company to invest invest in first part and second part do you want or are you seeking to have any seats on the board of the company to invest in? i see yeah yeah definitely engaging and in fact if you go to the um saints website you can find the the latest annual stewardship report and it's in that report we detail you know quite a lot of detail on engagements we've had with all of our holdings because we do a lot of that we think that's really important mm -hmm. um so so yes on engagement the do we look to have seats on their bill or boards no typically not because if it's got to a stage where we feel that we need to have a seat on the board to really influence change, then something's probably gone a bit wrong with the investment. You know, we, we it, it, that, that shouldn't be the stage we're at. What we're, what we're looking for are, are great management and boards of the companies we'd invest in, who we invest mm -hmm. kind of alongside, who we can support and engage with. But ultimately, we trust them. They're running the business. They know what's best for it. They're getting on with it and delivering the results that we hope for. If, if it got to a stage where we're like, we have to ask for a board seat, I think more naturally you'd be saying, should we actually just be disinvesting from this company yeah. if it's so far off course? Because like, it would be too late anyway. Yeah, it, 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 it would be a tough one. Um, this question I thought is quite charming. Um, it asks, do you trim your winners to stop the portfolio getting out of balance? Occasionally. Um, we have We have a a rule that we won't let anything be more than um, five, well, purchase 5% and, and run it to 6% of the equity yeah. portfolio to, because we're, we're big believers in that kind of 
resilience, diversification, and and sometimes something that fund managers can sometimes do is they can get a bit carried away with one idea and they think it's the greatest thing ever. But the thing is, is that there's there's quite a lot of randomness still. However hard you try, and a lot of stock outcomes mm-hmm. and, and companies, if you if you look at the history. And so our view is, look, you can have some conviction up to a point, but so, so when things go through that, we did it with Novo Nordisk within the past six months. We took some took the holding down a bit to bring it back under that five percent level. Just you know, bearing in mind that you know that there's there's random outcomes that happen. All of that said, we try not we try hard not to trim our winners too much because I think if you again if you look back at the history of investment management over long periods, um, and you can see this from. Warren Buffett through to um, Tom Gaynor, to all kinds of investors will tell you that you, you are picking stocks. And the most important thing you can do is do you own it or not? That's what you need. Mm-hmm. That's what you need to get right. Trimming things, you're, you're kind of interfering with natural compounding. Yeah. If you're trying to sort of add a little bit of value, be, oh, I'm going to be clever. I'm going to take 30 bits out and I'm going to put it into this one over here. It tends not to add value. That the, the, it, 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 It's quite a mixed record on that. You're interfering with compounding. So we try to stay away from that and let winners run up to a point. And then when they get quite large, that's when we start trimming them back. But doesn't it make your heart bleed when they're doing so well and then you have to trim them and cut them back down? Yes, but but it's not that often because it's 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 done so well by the time it's yeah. got up to five six percent that it, it's okay. I I can I can live with that. Oh, it's done fantastically well, and I had to take a bit of money off the table. That's okay. That's better than the other problem, which is I put money into this thing that had gone down a lot. Now it's gone down even further. With that, that that's quite behaviorally that's quite challenging as well. So so it's fine. It's fine. We can we can live with that. Fair enough. Um, does private equity have a place in things? Is another question from the audience it, it could it could do you know to, um it's it's possible um and in fact at, at, point, at points over the past 150 years the board has the board has done that and made some of those allocations the challenge is, is we take liquidity seriously and we think there's a there's a cost to that and so we 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 think about that and obviously private tends to be less liquid now we own directly our property and that's a liquid so we have a we have a capacity for it but we just got to be careful about how much how far you go with that and then I guess the other thing is a lot of times private equity type businesses, uh, particularly now, you know, there's a lot of sort of startup or early stage type businesses. Now, those make sense for a lot of trusts. I would say our colleagues, some of our colleagues at Bailey Gifford running other funds are very, very good at that, to be honest. Um, but I think for Saints, because of our dividend growth focus, typically those businesses are not paying out dividends. They're much more immature. They're at an earlier stage in their life. So again, it doesn't really make sense for Saints. It's not what we're doing. It's not what we're looking for. Could, could do up to a certain point, but for the most part, no. And, and, you, and the equity portfolio is 100% listed equities today. Mm-hmm. How about that one then? Um, so there's a trend that some trusts pay enhanced dividends by including an element of capital. Is that mm. something you would consider with Saints? Is that an approach you would be looking to adopt at any that's point? A, that's a great question. And it's honestly, it's one I, I and the board, and we thought about that a lot over time. Um, and, and Saints technically does have the ability to, do, could do that. It could pay income out yeah. of capital. I guess my, uh, and, and, the, and the board shares this, so Saints pays all of its income out, out of natural revenue that it's earning from dividends and from rents. It doesn't pay any out of capital. And I think the, the challenges with that are if you're paying income out of capital, then you get to those unfortunate positions now and again where, you know, values have fallen a lot. So let's say it's 2020, the market's down 30% and you're selling shares to generate income. And sometimes that just doesn't make sense. It's not very mm. good. And you get into this thing, oh, should we cut the dividend? Should we support? Uh, and, and you're kind of shrinking the company the whole time by paying it out. So that that's problematic. And 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 then there's another thing, which is kind of if if shareholders want to do that, they 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 can do that themselves. They don't need the the board to do that for them. They can they can generate income themselves by selling a bit of their capital, selling some of their shares. So is it really helpful for? investment trusts to be doing that themselves mm-hmm. that doesn't make sense for so so what we try to, we on sites try to generate the income naturally uh, sort of natural level through our uh, revenues and have a covered dividend and, yeah. and i think the, the 
the way it works really nicely, I think, for Saints is because of this focus on dividend paying companies, but not, not super high yielders, just really good, high quality growth companies. We hope that we can have we can give shareholders the best of both worlds. So we can generate the good income that's growing. It's also resilient. It's coming out of natural income. And, and neither we nor our shareholders are ever having to sell capital to create income in those stress periods. Mm-hmm. But by focusing on those types of companies that can do, you can have it all kind of thing. Is that's what that, that's what we're trying to do with Saints. Gotcha. This next question also focuses on dividends, and it comes from someone who's retired, and they quote okay. the um, the investment blurb first. They say the objective of Saints is to grow the dividend at a rate faster than inflation, yep. which is something they need right now as a retiree. Yeah. Um, can they rely on the dividend going up by at least 10% this year? I know I'm putting you on the spot here, James. I'm sorry, but it's a good question. <laughs> um, the, so th- I, I'm assuming that then the, the, the person asking the question is convinced that inflation will be 10% this year. And that's... that's, that's so it sounds. Which, um, uh, I mean, look, we're, we're looking at this as a board. I, I'm not trying to duck the question. Last year, inflation averaged 9%. And Saints dividend grew just over 9%. So we managed it last year. And I think we are very well set up for that because we have this this approach that invests in really good real growth companies. So that's a great starting point. Um, And we've got a revenue reserve as well, which can top things up. Now, will we beat inflation again this year? I think the average forecast is, I think it's supposed to be 7% on average during the year, falling to 4% by the end of the year, last time I looked. So so will let's say, will we? Will the board be able to grow the dividend faster than inflation again this year? I'm hopeful that's the case because we've got a growth portfolio because there's the revenue reserve to back it up. Um, but I'm, I'm hesitating because, you know, our objective is to try and do that over rolling five-year periods and not yep. every single year guaranteed will beat inflation because yep. it might be that the board says you know what actually this year it, it makes sense to not grow the dividend quite so much bring it's a little bit behind inflation mm-hmm. because we see some other opportunity so um I'm, I'm hopeful we'll beat inflation again this year but i can't guarantee that definitely will happen um and, and it's, it's ultimately a board call yeah we don't have a crystal ball at the end of the day yeah, we've got, we've got a good growth portfolio that's resilient and, and has real underlying growth in it. Um, yeah. And I will say that, you know, we're looking at the, the full year results we're getting from our holdings are just coming through the past month or so. It's early days. We've only done, I don't know, 20, 25 percent of the portfolio. Um, but they're, they're announcing their dividends for this year, which will really set the income that, that Saints earns for the rest of the year. And, you know, to be honest, if anything, those those the growth rates are surprising us on the upside. You know, we're seeing mm-hmm. we're seeing nine, 10, 15, 20 percent increases. The trouble is we're only sort of like a fifth of the way through the portfolio, a quarter of the way. So it may be too early to judge. But early signs are we're we're, we're feeling pretty good that we're going to get continued dividend growth through from the companies this year. Mm-hmm. And this leads nicely to my next question, which is also my final uh, up. Which is also my final question. Sorry, can't talk today. Um, where do you see the biggest promise for dividend growth? Biggest promise for dividend growth? I, I would just say it's, it's individual names. Like we've got, um, it, rather than any kind of grouping or theme or geography, I would say we've got a list at the moment on our focus list of, well, Ross and I were discussing it yesterday and, and, and Toby's thought, uh, sorry, we're just discussing it as a team. And, and I think we said there's probably six names at the moment where we're really close to thinking, OK, this looks really attractive and this this could be. And they're very different companies, very different. They're not um, any any particular theme going through them. We've got everything from distribution through to um medical devices through to all, all kinds of things in there so it's it, i guess as usual it's just individual companies where we think hey great long-term growth prospects sustainable business model resilient dividends great people running it it's um it, we've got a a, hand, a handful of those that could come through that's that's where i see the best prospects the individual names i don't suppose you could share any of those company names uh no i won't do that because then if i do that and then actually we don't it doesn't quite go over the line but, like, but you said you were going to buy it and then you didn't buy it you know, so i, I, <laughs> I won't uh, let's set that up i'll wait until um uh you know we will report we, we're, we're good at prompt and reporting and we'll we write and you know uh, put in the manager's report and we do explain those as soon as we make them you know last year we did 
L'Oreal, um, Intuit and Cognex, all of which I'd say we're very excited about, great long-term prospects ahead of them. Um, and, and we write those up and explain to shareholders why and why they're a good fit and so forth. So we will do that when we buy them, but I won't front run that by uh, giving you any names now. Let's just see which one of those, which, which of those six get over the line. Something to look forward to then. Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah, it keeps it exciting. Yeah. <laughs> James, thank you so much. That was great. Yeah, more than welcome. And thanks again to everyone who, who dialed in. Indeed. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Thank you.